Everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to start in just a minute here as, as we let more people into the room. I think we may have reached our max actually. Um, so should we get started? <laughs> um, welcome everyone. My name is Becca Wolf. Um, I'm the senior advocacy strategist for the American Immigration Council. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar, um, Biden's new parole in place program, helping mixed status families stay together. Uh, as you all probably know, this is about an announcement that came out very recently. So we appreciate having our panelists able to join us on, on some short notice and go through um, what we do and do not know about uh, the new program and, and what we are sort of looking forward to in the future. Uh, a couple of sort of housekeeping items. Uh, this will be recorded and people who um, have registered will be able to get a, a recording of the webinar afterwards along with some follow-up items. Um, please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, um, rather than in the chat. We will be looking at the Q&A, but not the chat. Uh, so please um, feel free to do that throughout the presentation and we'll try to get to questions and answers at the end, as many as we can. Uh, just sort of a, by way of a, a warning, um, we are not gonna be able to answer specific questions about specific cases or give sort of practice advisory information right now. This is still very new. And so we're really just sort of getting into what is in this um, and what we're looking forward to. But please feel free, of course, to check back in and, and get on our email list. And we will be likely sending out things like practice advisories or other kinds of information. Um, as soon as, you know, sort of as they, they come up. Um, with that, uh, I will introduce our two fantastic panelists. Um, first, we have Adriel Orozco, who is our senior policy counsel at the American Immigration Council. And then we also have Dara Lind, who is our uh, senior fellow at, at the council. Thank you both for, for coming. Um, we're going to be talking first about sort of where this um, project lives in, in the wider uh, array of, of parole and place um, uh, policies. Uh, talk a little bit, of course, about what is in the actual announcement and what we think the policy is going to be. And then there is an item, obviously, I, hopefully uh, people know, um, that relates specifically to DACA that we will be getting to, although... Um, sort of not not to to um, ruin the the end but there's not a lot of information um out on that particular part uh but we will be letting you know sort of what is in it as we as we go along so with that uh, i will pass it to my colleague adriel to talk about sort of the context of of this um, announcement great thank you becca uh, hi everyone so first i just wanted to bring up a little bit about uh, parole and parole in place, just so people have like an idea about where this came from. Uh, so it's been, of course, people probably have been hearing about parole in the news media for quite some time. So um, it is a statutory uh, uh, authority that the president has. Um, and it's been used since, uh, I think the earliest is 1956 by presidents, uh, both Republican and Democrat uh, in various situations. Uh, you know, most recently, people have probably heard of uh, President Biden's use of the parole authority to allow certain individuals to come into the United States uh, because of, um, you know, extraordinary conditions and, and uh, conflict in other countries, uh, sort of like the Afghan withdrawal, uh, the U.S. military's Afghan withdrawal in August 2021. We um, also uh, use it as a country for uh, Ukrainian nationals uh, with the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, and so uh, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the use of that parole has been um, for different policy choices. Um, one of which has been to, you know, uh, try to create different pathways for people to come into the United States. 
and not necessarily uh, arrive uh, and make the, uh, the dangerous journey to the border. And so the difference here is that parole is being used uh, for people already in the United States. Um, and so this is actually not a new thing. Uh, it's something that has been used since the earliest of 2007. Um, and uh, under uh, George uh, W. Bush, his presidency, uh, there was a uh, wife of a military service member who had gone missing in Iraq. And um, she was in removal proceedings. And so she was in um, a pretty difficult situation uh, because she depended on her, her spouse. And so um, the federal government used... Um, this parole authority, which is sort of a quasi status, it's like um, giving people temporary protection um, to, uh, you know, come into the United States. It's, it's sort of like a legal fiction. It's um, people are trying to get permission to come to the United States, but they they use this parole authority um, to allow her uh, to get um, sort of this permission um, of being in the United States to be able to move forward in her um, application for legal permanent residency and then U.S. citizenship. Um, and so then that policy, which uh, was more formalized uh, in 2010, is called military parole in place. Um, and so uh, Dara will talk a little bit more about that legal issue that, you know, really is something that has existed uh, since 1996, when the federal government started requiring people, um, uh, certain people to have to leave the United States if they came in without permission. And so this is really what parole in place is, is very helpful for, for individuals who are on a path to a green card. Um, but because of uh, unlawful presence and their unlawful entry into the United States, they can't continue on to um, getting that green card. And so um, one thing I just wanted to make sure to emphasize is that um, so this military parole in place program has existed for now for more uh, than a decade. Um, it allows uh, uh, family members of service members, um, they can be in the reserve or active service members, um, to be able to apply for this special parole. And so the service members can be the U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents. And uh, what that does is that gives these uh, non-citizen family members one year of um, of uh, protection in the United States. They can get a work permit as well as if they'd like. But really the, the, the big opening um, uh, that this has for them is to be able to continue on uh, with their green card application if it requires them, uh, if they're otherwise required to leave the United States so that they don't have to leave the United States. Um, and yeah, that's that's it. Um, if people have any more questions about military parole in place or parole in place generally, um, please let me know. Thanks, Adriel. And yeah, actually, Ayla has had a program about uh, military parole in place um, for a while. And so there are resources for that. Really appreciate that context, Adriel. Um, Dara, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about what is and is not in the rule, um, what we know and what we don't know. Uh, appreciate it. Great. So, right. So to, I just kind of want to, I want to start by going into a little bit more about why the military spouses that have benefited from parole in place and the people who are now eligible for this, for this new parole in place program, why it is that parole gives them, it, this is, this is meaningfully different from the Biden administration's use of parole for Afghans, for Ukrainians, for, you know, Cuban stations, Nicaraguans and Venezuelans, not just because it applies to people who are in the United States, but because even though it isn't granting them any new formal legal status, it is intended, as Adriel said, to open the door for them to be able to apply for green cards and permanent residency. Now, the reason that it can do that is that, as Adriel mentioned, in 1996, the federal government said that in the IRA IRA law that if you had been, if you were in the US for a certain amount of time, without having been inspected or paroled into the U.S., like if you were accruing illegal presence, then you would not be able to leave and re-enter legally for a certain amount of, it would, it would, it would bar you from, from re-entering on some form of legal status. And for people who have been in the U.S. for a while, that period is 10 years. So that ended up getting running directly into the general principle in U.S. immigration law that one of the ways you can get permanent residency in the United States is by being married to a U.S. citizen, because a lot of spouses of U.S. citizens were, in fact, in the U.S. without having been, you know, inspected uh, or like in, in, inspected and admitted or inspected and paroled. 
So what ended up having to happen was that people would have to, in as part of their application for permanent residency, they would have to apply for a visa outside the U.S., leave the U.S. for their interview at the consulate, and then have the unpleasant surprise of actually you, you know, triggered this 10-year bar. Uh, there is an available waiver for this where for, you know, compelling circumstances or for, for you know, hardship to the family that that can be waived and you can still qualify for permanent residency. But without knowing whether or not you were going to trigger that bar when you left, hoping that you were going to be able to get the waiver wasn't really a sufficient motivation for people to risk, you know, being set when when the alter when it's a choice between not getting your green card and being separated from your family for 10 years, people were more willing to not not risk the potential separation. The Obama administration tried to create a way through this tangle by allowing people to apply for waivers before they left the U.S., calling them provisional unlawful presence waivers. Uh, unsurprisingly, like a lot of things over the last 10 years that USCIS adjudicates, that process has gotten very, very prolonged. And so right now, it takes an average of 41 months, uh, which is to say, you know, almost four, close, closer to, to, I guess, three and a half years than four, um, to even get this provisional waiver and then you have to go through the whole leaving the country going through the consulate all of that and so it continues to be a really really big barrier for people who would again it, in principle as a general rule be eligible through their U.S. citizen spouses so the Biden administration by allowing this population of people to get parole uh, and we'll get I'll, I'll 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 finish by talking through what we know about like who this who exactly this population is, but just in you know by by allowing some of the people who are married to U.S. citizens to get parole, it allows them to check the if like the kind of check the mental box in the law, saying yes, I've now been inspected and paroled into the United States, so I'm no longer subject to that whole leave the U.S. potential ten year bar rigmarole. I'm now eligible to just apply to adjust my status to that of a permanent resident like anybody else who is married to a, a U.S. citizen and living in the United States. So that's going to allow people, as Adriel mentioned, to be able to get work permits in the short to medium term. But really, the purpose of this is that these people are not going to be on parole at the place forever, that, there's, that this is really just a bridge until their permanent resident applications have been approved. So you know, the, the general rule on who is eligible for this is that it's, it applies to people who have been in the U.S. for 10 years or more without, you know, who, who entered without inspection, who haven't had immigration status, who are married to U.S. citizens as of the, you know, the date that this was announced, so last Tuesday. Um, and, and while we don't know, we know that there are going to be some other requirements in terms of, like, criminality, in terms of, terrorism bars, that kind of thing. We don't know, we don't have details on what those are going to look like. In general, we have gotten, the, the administration has said in general that it's going to be limited to people who are eligible to adjust their status to that of permanent residency. So there are lots of existing bars in the law for who qualifies for that. And while we don't know for sure that it's going to track those exactly, our sense is that in general, that's who it's going to be. Now, that's a pretty complicated legal question on a case-by-case -case basis. That's the kind of thing that people usually have to go to immigration lawyers to adjudicate. And so, you know, while we don't know this stuff yet and we're anticipating that there's going to be, you know, a form issued to apply for parole in place, that there's going to be instructions with that form, that there's going to be, you know, a, a further FAQs and regulations in the next couple of months, probably no earlier than August, that people not try not listen to anyone who says they can apply now, but that they consult a legal professional so that they, you know, so that they either now or once more details are in place, have a clearer sense of whether this is something that they can benefit from. Because we know we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we know it's going to be a little bit more complicated than say DACA applications or CHNV or some of the other newer uh, some of the programs that are created as you know temporary statuses in their own right rather than being this kind of bridge to an existing application
That's great, Dara. Um, and I, I know that people are putting things in the in the Q&A and, and to reiterate something that Dara just said, um, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know yet that the, the language of the rule says, for example, that on a case, as Dara just said, on a case by case basis, some things will be taken into consideration, including bars or including criminal history. And so a lot of the questions um, that I'm seeing in the Q&A just flagging, um, it, that's going to be our, our answer to, the, to, to many of those. Um, but before we get to the q and I want to turn it back over to Adriel to talk about um, the other part of the rule that, that is sort of some in, in some uh, areas getting less attention, which are the D3s and the, and the um, the implications for DACA. Yes, thank you, Becca. Um, yes, and so I'll, I'll try to go relatively quickly, but if people want more information, uh, we can talk about it as well, because I, I do see that there's a lot of questions about this family unity parole in place. Um, and so uh, just generally speaking, you know, so this is trying to address somewhat of a similar issue. So there are a lot of folks, and so this really arose because there, there are folks who have DACA um, who might be in um, you know, employment situations uh, where they might be eligible for an employment-based um, uh, temporary work, per, uh, um, sorry, work visa. Um, but because they are in the United States, uh, some of them might've entered without permission. Some of them might have accrued some unlawful presence. Um, that prevents them from being able to shift into um, what's called a non-immigrant visa, or it's just essentially a temporary visa. And so um, already in the law, um, there exists a waiver. It's called a D3 waiver generally because of um, you know, the statute that it's found in. Um, and it allows the individual to be able to ask for you know, forgiveness for having violated uh, certain um, laws. Um, and, and generally speaking, you know, immigration law creates these sort of barriers, these bars. And so people have to ask for waivers so that those bars aren't used against them. And so some of the bars relate to unlawful presence and um, having entered without permission. And so, you know, some of these folks at DACA were able to, you know, request maybe an H-1B visa if they worked in like a specialty occupation of sorts, um, like a nurse or like a specialized doctor. Um, but in order to get that visa, they would have to leave the United States um, and then go through a consulate, get the visa abroad, wait to see if their waiver was going to be approved, and then come back into the United States with their approved visa if their waiver was approved. Um, the issue is that D3 waiver, that there, there aren't that many um, pieces of guidance for consulate officers around the D3 waiver. And so um, similar to spouses who had to leave the United States, there was just a lot of uncertainty for individuals who had to leave the United States um, to get these D3 waivers, not sure if they were gonna get them uh, again. And that really prevented people from applying um, for these opportunities. Um, also, it's important to note that this isn't necessarily going to impact such a broad population uh, because uh, employment-based uh, visas are a little bit, are, can be difficult to get. And also because um, a lot of them are capped by our government. And so um, for example, H-1B is probably the most popular visa that people could qualify for. Um, however, uh, uh, by uh, law, only 65,000 visas can be issued a year with 20,000 additional ones for a master's level um, employment. Uh, there are some exceptions of people work, you know, at, at particular research institutions that are related to uh, universities or colleges or certain nonprofits related to those um, institutions as well. And so it's really important to, you know, talk to an immigration attorney to make sure and see if the employment that you have might qualify. Um, but uh, yeah, Really, the, the focal point there is that um, some of these are limited. Um, every year, uh, there is a lottery to see who um, can get one of these visas. And so there are a lot of people who are left out as well. And so, um, but it does open a new avenue. It doesn't open a new avenue. It, it um, provides more clarity for this avenue for individuals who want to pursue it. So essentially what the Biden administration has announced is that they're gonna create um, clear guidance as to when consular officers um, can recommend um, that a D3 waiver be approved for a particular individual. The great thing is that this does not necessarily, is, this is not limited to DACA. It's actually um, much broader than that for individuals who have 
great, uh, graduated college um, in the United States um, and have a job offer and potentially qualify for one of these employment-based visas. Um, one important thing to note, though, is that even though, you know, generally, we haven't seen exact language yet, um, the Department of State said that in about 30 days, they'll be giving us more information. Um, but the H-1B, you know, uh, it requires a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Um, so like if a person is working in a position that requires a bachelor's degree or equivalent experience, that could qualify. So it's not um, exactly, uh, you know, a red line. So it's, that's why it's also important to, because a, a, an attorney has to evaluate the job to make sure that, um, you know, the basic requirements of the job are met with the H-1B, for example. Um, but, you know, the important thing is that this is supposed to create more clarity, more certainty for individuals who do have a job offer, who can qualify for an employment-based visa so that then they can um, go ahead and, uh, when they leave the United States, they'll have more more certainty as to whether or not they actually will be able to get this D3 waiver. That was incredible. Uh, <laughs> um, thanks for breaking that down. Uh, so we, I, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to the panelists to discuss. It just so happens that these are questions that other people have also already put in the Q&A. Uh, so the questions that we anticipated are, in fact, ones that people are going to have. And then we'll open up to, to some of the questions uh, that have come up in the in the Q&A box. So first, um, predictions on litigation. Um, there are a lot of questions. And what do we think um, are, are the potentials uh, for um, a conservative state or someone else to to file suit to try to enjoin uh, this from being put into place? Yes. Well, the thing that we definitely know is that there will be a lawsuit. Um, we know that this will be litigated. Um, American First Legal, which is an organization co-founded by uh, a former Trump advisor, Stephen Miller, um, has already pledged and is actually fundraising to file a lawsuit um, to block this program. And so we do know that, um, you know, this organization, American First Legal, has worked with states um, like Texas to bring other immigration related lawsuits. Um, and so we, we do expect that there will be a lawsuit. Um, you know, I think uh, in terms of the strength of the lawsuit, I think it's still a little bit unclear. Um, we do know that um, uh, there there was like, there, there have been some legal interpretations within the department, uh, well, back then INS, Immigration Naturalization Services, around this program since um, the late 90s. So there has been some legal analysis internally around, uh, you know, their ability to do this. There is a statute which is di very different from other cases like DACA, which was more of a internal priorities um, kind of assessment. So there is a different um, sort of uh, legal footing here than in other cases. We did see that, you know, uh, the Texas initiated case against um, the CHNV, um, program, uh, which is a parole program for nationals of Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, um, that uh, the district court, a conservative judge, um, uh, found that Texas did not have standing in that case, which meant that Texas just wasn't um, the right plaintiff because they weren't appropriately injured in that case, and they're, they're, it is on appeal. So that may be another situation that comes up here where it'll be difficult to find the right plaintiff um, to bring this case. So that's another issue that could come up. Um, so it, a lot of there's not it's not very clear about the, the strengths of the, the arguments yet. But what is very clear is that there will be a lawsuit um, that we've we've seen from announcements by this organization, at least this organization. I'm sure there are others as well that are considering it. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, even if there is litigation and ultimately some kind of adverse decision against the administration, whether that's a temporary ruling that they have to stop the program or some kind of permanent ruling, even if that happens, if it happens after the program has gotten up and running, once an individual person has been granted parole in place under this program, even if the program is struck down, even if that individual parole is revoked, they still count as having been paroled into the United States, which means they're still eligible to apply for adjustment of status from within the United States rather than having to go through the entire provisional unlawful presence waiver and leaving process. So that's, you know, there's, it's, it's not necessarily, it's like not to say that it's more legally foolproof than other programs. It's a totally different axis, but it does mean that 
if you're eligible for this program, there's no reason to wait to apply based on whether or not it's going to hold up in court. Because even if it does get struck down, if you get through that door before it closes, you'll still be eligible to apply for permanent residency based on having been paroled by having that parole approved. I think more and, and sort of more specifically to that, because the timing of applying, you know, I think it's very possible that it would be enjoined before they even issue the process for how to fill out the application. One of the things people are considering is is sort of like, well, can can a Trump administration just wave a wand and, and rescind this? And that's, you know, also to Dara's point. Um, it is it is sort of a, a bell that cannot be unrung once you've been paroled. Um, that is a thing that happens in a moment in time. Uh, and so you've if if you're granted the parole, the parole itself can't be rescinded, as as Dara just said, even if the program itself is is taken down by a future um administration. Um, can you all talk a little bit about, or, or I'm happy also to to jump in if I've put you on the spot, um, about sort of Adriel explaining more what you when you said that the litigation on the CHNV was was um, was denied based on standing and how that affects sort of similar lawsuits for for folks who are not litigators or, or lawyers on the line. Yeah, I mean, happy to talk about it. And if you want to add anything, Becca. Um, so essentially, in, in um, any case that goes before a federal court, an individual, um, the, a plaintiff, um, has to show that they've been injured by a particular policy. Um, uh, and they have to be injured by that specific policy. And so what's been happening with um, a lot of these cases when states are, are suing the federal government, they bring in uh, particular arguments like, you know, we're going to have more immigrants in the United States um and document immigrants in particular and they're going to be using our resources we're going to have to provide them driver's licenses health care education um things like that and so they try to use that as an argument to say that they're going to be injured or harmed by the policy um the district court in that case if i remember correctly indicated that the uh that the CHNV programs actually were having the intended effect of actually decreasing the amount of individuals who were using unlawful pathways to enter the United States and actually entering through um, the, the parole pathways through airports, um, as was intended by the federal government. And so <clears throat> this made it a little bit more complicated um, for for Texas to to say that you know this was a, a negative thing for it that the, this, they were actually being harmed by this policy, and so I think here in this case um, it might be difficult um, given that these individuals have already been in the United States, for example, for quite some time. Um, you know, uh, maybe some of them already have been working. They can show that they you know, you know paid their taxes already, gotten a lot of service was from the states. It might be a little bit difficult for. Um, some of these states to say uh, that they were actually harmed um, immediately by this policy, given that individuals have been here. And also, you know, I think it's really important to note that um, these people are otherwise on a path to citizenship. Just because of bureaucratic and legal barriers, they're um, in, impeded from actually um, getting legal permanent residency um, and then eventually citizenship. And so, <clears throat> um, in some ways, actually, this policy is even better because you don't have folks who are undocumented, who are not um, able to, um, uh, you know, get full access to, I mean, everybody has like labor rights in the United States, but a lot of times people are exploited because um, they have fear and that kind of thing. So anyway, so so those are some of the, the arguments that I would probably bring up in that regard. Thanks, Adriel. Yeah, and I, I mean, a number of these lawsuits that have been brought by states, not just about parole, but some of the other things that, that they have been trying to challenge, essentially saying the, the, the administration doesn't have the power to do this thing by just doing it via rule or executive order. A number of those have been struck down for, for, for because of standing. And so, um, it, it, we're in a slightly more optimistic, I think, about this one and its success um, in, in a kind of court challenge than we may have been um, even a year ago because some of those those cases have been resolved in in the you know in in the past year that have clarified some of those legal issues. Um, and I, so to both of you, either one, um, can you give it a, a little bit of context? And Dara, you sort of have already started this. The context of this policy in the wider web of what the Biden administration um, 
is trying to do with regards to border policy and any other policy that this is sort of touching on? Sure. So, you know, there are, I think, two threads here that this plays into in terms of how the Biden administration sees immigration and what it can do about it. Uh, first of all, there's what Adriel mentioned earlier, which is the use of parole as a, a legal as as a legal pathway that ex that can both relieve pressure at the US Mexico border for people who would otherwise have to present themselves without authorization in order to, you know, get humanitarian protections or in order to be in the United States for a certain amount of time and to kind of to reduce these other problems that have ex that have been created with the legal immigration system that have led to family separation. So, you know, the Biden administration has also reopened and expanded use of the family reunification parole programs, which existed under previous administrations, and which the purpose of which is to take families that are stuck in the backlog, in the in the, in the visa backlog, and allow them, if, you know, if you have a pending application and your date just hasn't come up yet, and the government sends you an invitation to apply for parole, you can do so and then come live in the U.S while your case works its way through that backlog. So this is kind of a cousin to that. It's another use of parole to smooth some of these things that in theory are just bureaucratic hangups, but in practice have resulted in a lot of pain for a lot of families. And it's also in line with the Biden administration's, you know, general approach that people who are in who have been in the US for a long period of time should be able to live, you know, without fear and should ultimately be able to regularize their status. You know, there hasn't, uh, there's not a whole lot that the Biden administration can do to open a door to citizenship for people who are currently ineligible for it. That's one of the things that Congress has to do and Congress has, you know, failed to do for several decades. But in this particular case, the Biden administration had the opportunity to make people, to take this group of people for whom citizenship was theoretically, or you know, permanent residency ultimately allowing them to apply for citizenship was theoretically available, but in practice out of reach and bring it a little bit closer to being in reach for them so that they didn't have to live in the US without status despite theoretically being eligible for permanent residency if all of the paperwork had lined up correctly and if USCIS weren't you know, taking so very long to adjudicate everything. Thanks for that. And I, I'm going to jump in with sort of a, a little bit trying to condense some of the questions into a response and then throw some more out to you all, if that's okay. So there's a lot of questions about sort of the intersection, how this operates in, in intersecting with either a waiver, a, the 10 year bar, the three year bar. And it's a little bit, um, it, it's, 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 it's interacting with the, with the law much earlier in that process. So the eligibility is if someone has been in the United States for 10 years continuously. So there are questions in the, in the chat about, you know, what if people have come and gone, it has to be 10 years of continuous presence. That is a legal term of art in, in immigration, which sometimes is not as clear as, as we think it is. So, um, but it, that's what the, the announcement says, 10 years of continuous presence and a spouse of a US citizen as of June 17th. So we interpret that to mean that the person had to have been a US citizen as of June 17th and that they have had to have been married as of June 17th. So that, that's a, a number of questions in there about natsing and citizens, um, you know, natsing now and will that count? Um, so as far as we know, that's how they're interpreting it. I will just say, again, for the record, um, we're expecting two more um, clarifications of this. One is a federal um, register notice, which should have more information about it that they have the the administration that says will become will be coming soon um and then there could be some other um elements of rulemaking uh and and sort of some other some other things that maybe maybe uh coming down the pipeline so so there should be more clarity but what is actually in the announcement of this is what it is 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 pretty narrow still um so the the other thing I will I will say there was a question about who who what family members are eligible. So the way that this is designed is that um, and and just to put a finer point on what uh, uh, Adriel and Dara already said is that um, people 
who would otherwise be able to adjust status, but for how they entered most recently. That's what it's getting at. And so for adjustment of status, honestly, whether that is someone adjusting status uh, because of a spouse through a spousal petition or you know, actually, Cuban Adjustment Act may be may be implied here too, uh, depending on how it all sort of comes comes out. Um, it is essentially saying that if you are eligible for this program, you are paroled, and so therefore, by the definitions of you know um, a green card application, where it says you know have you been admitted uh, or paroled, you've been paroled. So that's the only that's the piece of it that it is um, that the 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 parole in place. Uh, element of 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 the rule um is getting at uh and so it doesn't it's not op that part of it is not operating itself as a waiver um and, and so just to clarify sort of those things there's also a question about um children and whether or not children can apply for their parents um children cannot apply for their parents but a U.S. citizen can apply for a stepchild. So in, in these cases, um, technically what is happening is, is the, the petitioner, it, right? We, we talk about the U.S. citizen as sort of like the, the person who, who is applying for their spouse. So the U.S. citizen is applying for their spouse or for a stepchild uh, who entered, uh, who is undocumented and entered when they were a minor. So there's um, that that could overlap with folks who are otherwise eligible for DACA, I think, theoretically. Um, but it uh, that 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 could be sort of one of one of those elements. Um, I hope that was more clarifying than it was um, confusing. I will now sort of throw some of these questions um, to to Adriel and, and Dara. Um, there's a lot of questions here about how this interacts with people who have removal orders, who have unexecuted removal orders, who have other kinds of permanent bars, criminal convictions. I'm sort of grouping those all together to sort of see what, what your initial impressions are about, about um, whether those folks will be eligible. I mean, I, I think that this is something where I, I will give two answers. The first and most important answer is that you should plan to consult a legal professional when more details come out. Um, that you know, and 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 that goes both ways. That's like don't trust anybody who says that they can answer that question for you now because they're trying they they are trying to mislead you about what's currently going on. Nobody can apply yet. We don't have instructions on you know on eligibility that are detailed enough for anyone to answer that question. But you should definitely plan to once we have more details, talk to someone and see if this is it, it, where you're going, where where a case that falls in that category will go. The other quest, the other kind of point that I'll make is that we have all we all we have is that in general this idea that if you would otherwise be eligible, but that you're subject to this unlawful presence waiver situation, then you're going to be able to apply for PIP for parole in place, and if not, then you're not. So we don't. I would say that we don't anticipate any radical divergence from the existing. You know, if 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 the if having the removal order or having an unexecuted order of having a criminal record blah 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 would be enough to disqualify you from adjustment of status then it's not then you're not going to be able to apply for pip in general but i think this is really something where we're going to you know we're going to have to wait and see we'll as becca mentioned probably be putting out some form of practice advisory ale will probably be putting some form of practice advisory out um, but it's really going, but, you know, any, any higher confidence than that would be really unfair and misleading. And Adriel, I don't know if you had something to sort of add, particularly about this question of like how it interacts with, with waivers or, or, um, other, um, sort of aspects of applying and adjusting status. Um, well, I think what Dara said, it just, it's, it's very, um, it's very accurate to say that we just don't have enough information to be able to answer a lot of those questions with certainty. 
Um, what I will say is that, um, you know, the big benefit that comes out of parole in place is really addressing um, the need for somebody to leave the United States and then the unlawful presence um, triggers that come after that. So it's either the three-year or the 10-year bar based on how long the person has been in the United States. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the president doesn't have um, all the tools to be able to completely waive um, a lot of the uh, bars, so to speak, or inadmissibilities that would apply to a person's case um, that could potentially make them ineligible for um, legal permanent residency. So I would I would just say that, you know, it, like, like Dara said, it, it, it doesn't seem like this would be much more expansive than what we've heard um, because of what the parole authority can really do in this situation for people who are applying for uh, potentially applying for legal permanent residency in the future. Um, but I do know that there are, you know, um, there's advocacy right now because the, you know, the uh, uh, president, the Department of Homeland Security, they have not actually published the Federal Register, which means that there's an opportunity to push the government to be as broad uh, in its application of this authority as possible. And so, um, you know, there's been questions as to whether or not people um, who maybe have left the United States um, wanting to wait out the three or the 10 years so that they can come back into the United States. Should they also be included in this policy, given that they decided to um, actually leave the United States and possibly were possibly tried to get a waiver at the consulate, but were denied. Um, and so maybe trying to see if they might qualify. So I think there's there's a lot of like gray areas given, you know, just the immensely different um, situations we all live by and just the very complicated immigration laws that we have. And so um, I think for any definitive answers, we still have to wait for that federal register for us to, to have those answers. Thanks, Adriel. And I will add, and um, maybe um, our our mysterious tech person behind the the um, the darkened video can help us with this. Um, there is an FAQ up on USCIS's website. I I, I promise it's not um, much more in detail than what we've been able to provide you. Um, but in case you sort of want to reference back to to some of the things we've said, um, again, it says. For example, um, it does, there's no categorical um, ineligibility for people who have criminal convictions. For example, it says, we'll look into it, essentially, case by case basis, um, merits, et cetera. Um, it also has something in there about people who are in current removal proceedings or who will be moved, you know, could be moved into removal proceedings. And again, uh, essentially what they're saying uh, at this point is we have not ruled any of this out. People are not being determined to be ineligible at this point based on those things. Uh, but we we anticipate that there will be some more um, details into what will or will not disqualify someone from, from being eligible. Um, so there's a question on, is there a, a limit to the number of these that are being granted? There, um, there is this number floating around of 550,000 potential um, Applicants or what what does that number represent and and how does how how do we think that the it's going to be processed numerically? So first of all, there is no cap or limit on this. It is not like the CHNB program, which you know has had to change the way, change the order in which applications are adjudicated because of the vast discrepancy between the number of applications coming in and the number of slots they have. So as far as we know. This should proceed according to normal immigration processing, which is first in, first out. Um, if there's anything that indicates that that's not going to be the case, we'll find out in the federal register notice, et cetera. But we know that there's not going to be a cap. The reason that that 550,000 number exists is it's an estimate of how many people are eligible according to the broad parameters laid out in the announcement last week. So the estimate is that there are 500,000 people living in the US who have been in the U.S. for 10 years, who are married to U.S. citizens, and therefore, in the broad outlines, are going to be eligible for this program. It, there's also an estimate, there is a kind of related estimate that there are 50,000 children 
who have been adopted by U.S. citizens because the U.S. citizen married their mother, which is the stepchild case that we addressed earlier. And so they'll be able to, with their parents, get parole in place through this program. So that's where that 550 comes from. It's not hard and fast. It's based on an estimate, based on kind of what we know demographically um, of the kind of maximum potential pool. Just like when DACA was first announced, you know, the number, there were like, it, it wasn't clear whether there would be 750,000 or a million or, you know, how many people would end up being eligible. And we had to see how many applications actually came in to get a better, better sense of the universe of actual beneficiaries. That's what's going on with that number right now. So to address a few of these about the children in particular, so this, this according to what is said, what is in there right now, it does not explicitly say that the stepchild has to have been in the United States for 10 years. That could change. Uh, it just doesn't say. Um, it doesn't say they don't have to be in 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 uh, the country for 10 years. It's it, the, the announcement isn't clear. When we're talking about stepchild and people are talking, what we're talking about is whether or not the stepchild is the stepchild of the U.S. citizen. So people are like, what about the biological child? If it's the biological child of the undocumented person, what, what the rule, not the rule, what the announcement says is that the U.S. citizen has to have been married to the undocumented person prior to June 17th. So essentially the, the, the spouse has to, to fit that eligibility requirement and the stepchild of the, that the, the U.S. citizen was in the United States before June 17th. So they're, they're, the reason a lot of people are like, how do we advocate for this to be done, you know, move beyond June 17th? This is really common in how these policies are developed, that they they are not, um, that they set a moment in time based on when the rule um, is, or the announcement or the order is issued. Um, and so it's, it's you know, a, a, a Biden administration could could announce an expansion of this at a future date, you know, in, in November 1st, say, we're going to expand this to anyone who is in the United States up until November 1st. Um, but that's generally how those things um, could happen. Um, so, uh, yes, um, there's some other folks who are like, uh, what, I don't understand the, the children question. Yes, if they are the biological children of the U.S. citizen, wherever they were born, they don't need this because they're U.S. citizens. So it's just the the child of the undocumented person um, who could be considered the stepchild of the U.S. citizen. Um, so one of the questions um, that that is coming up is sort of what happens to can we apply now? Can we just why can't we why don't we just start submitting an I-130 on these cases right now. Um, can you all respond to that? So I can't give any kind of guidance as to the wisdom of the I-130. Um, I'm going to let the actual lawyers determine whether that's a thing that we can or can't do. Um, but, you know, the the federal government's been pretty clear that the way they intend this program to work is that you apply for parole in place, you get your parole in place, and then you apply for adjustment from there. And so without having the form that says, here's how you apply for parole in place, it's everything, everything we've seen is that there, you know, is that the intention is for people to wait until that form comes out and then apply using that form. So, you know, they've they haven't free they haven't fully set up the process in a public facing way yet, but they have told us pretty clearly that that's the way they anticipate that process is going to go and that we need to wait until there is a form that you can apply that you can use to apply for parole in place under this process specifically before anything else with the case can move forward. Adriel, did you have anything um, also on that? Um, no, I mean, I think I, I will say that what people can do now, you know, if they're interested in, um, you know, doing something while we wait to get more clarity is that they can get documentation that just um, helps support what we know now. And so documentation that the, you have a person has been in the United States for at least 10 years. This can include bank statements. Um, this can include just any official letters, taxes, if a person did taxes. Um, 
although always talk to an attorney first because we want to make sure the taxes were prepared correctly. Um, uh, school records for your children that your name might be on, things like that for 10 years. Um, your marriage license, um, have, you know, some people might forget where they put that since, you know, you don't, might not use it often. So that as well, um, you know, any, um, uh, any in documentation that shows the spouse is a U.S. citizen, which could be their naturalization certificate, a birth certificate. Sometimes maybe you don't have a birth certificate because, um, you know, you never needed it. So now, now you do. Um, a, pa a U.S. passport can also function as well. If you have any criminal history, um, you know, you'll always want to see if you can assess that criminal history. By, well, if an attorney can assess that criminal history to make sure, um, you know, you can... Uh, well, whether or not you're eligible. So when that time comes, it's important to have any records um, of any arrests that you've had, any charges, any convictions of anything that you've had as well. Um, and then also one important thing is trying to note your immigration history. Um, uh, uh, you know, things probably happened quite a long time ago. Um, you know, uh, the average age of people who qualify for this is 23. I mean, I'm sorry, it's 40 years old and they've been in the United States for 23 years. Um, so just the, I mean, it's hard for me to think about what happened last week. Just imagine what happened, um, so many years ago. Right. And so if, if a person's average age is 40 and they've been in the United States for 23 years, that means they entered in their late teens. <laughs> so, um, God, I don't know what happened in my late teens. So, um, and so anyway, so I think it's just really important for people to sit down and think about that and get the information that they need because they will need to figure that out. Um, once uh, they're able to, uh, once more information is out there and they're able to speak to an attorney. Um, yeah, and I'll just add that the USCIS has sort of uh, also preemptively said, please don't apply until the application process is announced. Um, I think some people would think that you just file an I-131, which is an application for parole, among other things. Um, they have not said that that's all you have to do. So um, I, we, you know, USCIS is saying don't do it yet, um, but do exactly what, what Adriel just, just described. Um, there's some other questions about eligibility, and I wanted to make sure that that this was clear. Um, and apologies if it wasn't from the beginning. Um, they have to be eligible for parole, and and so a, a person who's eligible for parole is someone who um, is an what's called an applicant for admission who has not been admitted or paroled. So that means the people who have just overstayed a visa are not eligible. Um, it has to be someone who is considered an applicant of admission for admission, which is a term of art um, that that means someone who, when they came in, came in under specific circumstances of not having been admitted um, or paroled. So that's what the the parole in place uh, adjusts. So just just to clarify um, that particular point. Um, and and so I think that you know there are some other things. Um, can be uh, that that we're still waiting for for sort of more information, um, and we will. You know, there's a, a number of questions of sort of like, do we know um, what when it's going to come out? When are we going to get more information? And the truth is, is that we don't. Um, we tend to uh, announce important things via a blog. Uh, so folks who um, want to sort of get an update when there is something out um, can certainly make sure that you're on the council's email list. Um, one other thing that I will mention at the end, um, and we will distribute this again with, um, with follow-up from the webinar, which includes a recording of the webinar, we are doing one of our take actions, which is a, an, a, an opportunity for people to express their um, opinion about about the program um, to the White House um, and, and sort of uh, a, a moment to be able to say that, that we are, you know, while we, you know, certainly we applaud this, this movement towards addressing some of these longstanding issues, particularly addressing um, the immigrant communities that are here in the United States and have been here for a long time when so much focus has been on the border and new arrivals. Um, and also that that this is going to require resources and support to be implemented in a way that's that's reasonable and responsible. Uh, so we will be circulating a way for you to engage um, in that way. Um, otherwise, I know that there are still over 100 questions in the Q&A, and my apologies for not being able to get through all of them. Uh, as I have been scanning them, I think we've addressed quite a number of them, and, and a lot of the other ones um, are still sort of in that category of, 
we will know when they issue more information. Um, so with that, thank you so much, Adriel and Dara, for, for joining us. Thank you all for, for participating and joining us. Um, you will be getting an email follow-up with the information I uh, just explained. And um, when we know, uh, we'll let folks know. <laughs> Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.